We can live a day or two without water. We can't live a day or two without air. And I tell you, and this is an important fact, but Allah, the need for Iman is far more than the need for air. Because but Allah, you don't know where you would be. In an instant, death could come to you. And but Allah, in an instant, death could come to you and you could end up in an eternity of hellfire. You see, in the hereafter, after death, it's only two, two places. Either Jannah or Jahannam. That's it. That's it. It's either you're going to paradise or you're going to hell. There's no middle path. There is no way you can just end up on planet earth again. You wish there was re reincarnation. It's not going to happen. It's not happening. You're not going to come back as a rat. You're not going to come back as an insect. You're going to be a human being for the rest of eternity. Either in the depths of Jahannam or in the highest of, Jan of Jinan. The highest of paradise. So you have only one life. And this meager life of 50 years or 70 years will decide your eternity. This is where you are judging your eternity. This is the life by which you are buying your eternity. And so you have only one, one choice and only one chance. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, this iman that we have is really worth, worth saving. For more reasons than, than one. For more reasons than one. Because you see, we all have pure hearts, that's true. But we also have hearts that are made of glass and fragile and they turn. They move, as the statement of the, of the, of the poets, they used to say, the Arab poets, they say, مَا سُمِّيَ الْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا لِنَسِيهِ وَلَا الْقَلْبُ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ يَتَقَلَّبُ Mankind was not called mankind, insan in Arabic, except because he is someone who forgets. Nisyan in Arabic. So that's where insan comes from. And the heart has not been called the heart except it turns and wavers, an Arabic word called yataqallab. And so from taqallub or yataqallab comes the word heart, qalb. Because the heart is something that turns in and out. Today it believes, tomorrow it doesn't. Today it feels good, tomorrow it doesn't. Today it likes Islam, tomorrow it doesn't. Today it believes in Allah, tomorrow it doesn't. Today it's doing good deeds, tomorrow it's not. Just now you went and prayed, but now you are sinning, for example. And that's how the heart is, very, very weak. So it is for this reason why it's really important to preserve your heart. It's also important to preserve your heart because Rasulullah even he was warned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if he, if he did not stabilize his own heart and if he did not stabilize his own iman and if he did not protect his own iman from being blemished then even he would not find any safety from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran Allah says in the beautiful Quran, He says, O oh Muhammad, if we did not give you steadfastness in your Iman, if we did not give your heart steadfastness, if we did not give your heart steadfastness, you would have tended to turn towards the disbelievers and towards their path and towards the desires of the heart even a little bit. And even if that was to happen, even الحيات, if you were to do that, if you were to not protect your iman, and this is Allah telling Rasulullah if you didn't do that, if you didn't protect your iman, didn't safeguard your iman and you tended to waver your heart towards desires, I would have made you taste double the life and double the punishment. I would have made you taste life twice and death twice. And you would not have found anyone to save you from me. This is Allah telling Rasulullah Wasallam. If this is Allah telling Rasulullah Wasallam to be wary of protecting his iman, what about people like us? What about people like us but Allah? Allah of a surety warns us as well. That if we fail to protect our iman, Allah will offer surety take us to account and cause us to be of those people who have lost a lot of good in this life and in the hereafter. Also my friends, another reason why we should be concerned about protecting our iman is because by Allah, not a single day comes except that the day 
is has far more evil than the day before it this is why Rasulullah said that the last hour will not come until every single day the evil in it is far more than the evil in the day before it so today which is Friday the 5th of November in the year 2010 of the Christian calendar this day has far more evil that Allah has allowed on this earth than yesterday the Thursday 4th of November uh, of 2010 this is a fact by which there is simply no doubt about it is for this reason why the scholars even said that even though Umar bin Abdul Aziz radiallahu anhu who was the fifth Khalifa came later but just before him was kingship and the time of Yazid where there was a lot of killing and fighting in the Muslim world that even though Umar bin Abdul Aziz's time was a time of great blessings and mercy of, of, of Allah on this earth even then his time had far more evil than the time before it and the time of Umar had far more evil in that time than the time of Abu Bakr <coughs> and this is only because my friends Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that ultimately by Allah we will all at the last hour will not come until this world is engulfed in evil and it's for this reason why Rasulullah said inna bayna yaday as-sa'a fitanun ka qita'a al-layl al-mudlim yusbihu al-rajul fihi mu'minan wa yumsi kafira wa yumsi yumsi kafiran wa yusbihu mu'mina what did he say? he said verily in between the last hour between the coming of the last hour is fitna is evil like the blackness of the night darkness of the night it engulfs you and you don't even realize in that time battery is gone fitna evil sorry okay <laughs> all right in that time Rasulullah Sallam said he said verily indeed in that time a man will go to sleep in the morning a Muslim and will wake up a disbeliever and he will he will go to sleep a disbeliever and he'll wake up a believer and but Allah isn't that happening now that is happening right now <clears throat> that's precisely happening now do you know for example in September 11 when that fitna happened of September 11 how many newspaper reports did I find of people for example just on the day of September 11 on the day of September 11 how many people Muslims in America actually disbelieved in Allah because they said you know what oh my god Muslims have done it so therefore how can I be a, a, a Muslim how many people do I know of myself that went out they left Islam and they put up the American flag on their on their houses and said no I'm an American before I'm a Muslim how many people actually these sort of events Allah Azawajal makes them as a furqan as a division those people who disbelieve and those people who believe so my friends this is a fitna and how many families do I know of Muslim families where their children have become disbelievers don't you know of families like that I'm sure of I'm sure that you know of that do you know when I was in South Africa we know I'm, I love South Africa Muslims over there are strong great community strong community very good community mashallah but in South Africa I remember that there is a drug facility drug rehabilitation facility not for just any Muslim but for Muslims who are Hafad of Quran but then they became addicted to drugs we live in a time when this is happening we live in a time when fitna is all around us we live in a time when people leave the deen and then they come back and they go and they come back and it's amazing the level of fitna it's amazing what our kids are being taught at school it's amazing and possibly no one amongst us except that one of our children or one of our people in our lives are going to be touched by this fitna or the other so it is absolutely critical to preserve our iman and not just for this reason as well because the fitna is so strong but also because the challenges that, that we face as a community is so strong I remember landing on the in, in Heathrow once 
and I picked up a newspaper and I, it said on it, on the headlines, it said 74% of British kids, British kids in schools think Muslims are dirty people. You know, kids, kids don't think of the word terrorist. They don't know what terrorist is. But they know what ugly and beautiful is and they will know what dirty and clean is, right? So they said that they did a poll, a polling, and they found 74% of British kids think Muslims are dirty people. How are you going to change that? Imagine your kid going, going to the same school at, the, at, the, at these 74%. What are they going to think? What are they going to say? So imagine the struggle against their own iman that they will face in this 21st century. Also, I remember being on a panel on ABC radio, I remember one of the professors of media from, from Sydney University called in and he said that he had done a research on the number of media articles regarding Muslims in Australia and he found 90, 97, did he say or 96, I've forgotten the number, but it was in the high 90s. He said 96 or 97 percent of the media reports regarding Muslims in Australia are always negative. We are creating a community that doesn't like Muslims. There is a community outside there that thinks we are, I don't know what. Perhaps we're not human. Perhaps they're from Mars, Venus, Jupiter. Perhaps they think we are, I don't know what they think we are. But subhanAllah, they think we are not, we are less than Australian. And so my friends, this is a challenge. If the fitna of sex, drugs and rock and roll is not enough, if the fitna of the desires of this dunya and wealth is not enough, if the fitna that Allah has already decreed on this earth is not enough, then on top of that we have these challenges that have been put upon us. Yet as a community we are far more concerned about building our own homes and far less concerned about everything else surrounding it. You might actually be building your homes, by the way my friends, but your children may be living as disbelievers in those homes. That is not a successful plan. That is not a great plan. There has to be a better plan that you can come up with. So in the 21st century, we must come up with a better plan to lead our life. I have a few points of advice before my uncle takes the phone away from me, the microphone away from me. Couple of points of advice. Sorry, uncle? Yeah, go ahead. You okay, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you have some uh, tea? Would you like some tea? You sure? I have, I have tea. Th th there's some desserts as well. Yeah. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> okay. There's a few points of advice that I have for a community to, pres to preserve the Iman and for an individual to preserve their Iman. For the community, my friends, I would love for you all to focus, to focus on education. But Allah, when education comes into the heart and when the young ones learn and learn about the deen, it stays in their hearts. Young minds are like sponges. They will take it and it will stay with them. In an authentic narration, Rasulullah said, when a young child memorizes the Quran, Allah causes the Quran to be molded into his flesh and blood. Amazing hadith, wallahi. It's in Tabarani. He said, authentic hadith, he said what? A young child who memorizes the Quran, Allah causes the Quran to be molded into his flesh and blood. Meaning what? Meaning it's part of his soul, part of his body. He is from the party of Allah. Allah will take care of him. Even when you can't, and we, you are down in the belly of the grave, at that point, someone will look after your kid, and that is Allah. And so, focus on making your children learn the deen whilst they're still young. Not when they become old. Don't say that, okay, I will focus them on, on maths and science now, and forget about Islam. One of the things that I, I did, and I'm a living example, you can excel in both Islam and both secular sciences. You can. You can and you will. And you must make your children excel in both of them. Yes, they can be a doctor, they can be a lawyer, and they can be a sheikh as well. They can learn Islam and they can learn uh, other than that as well. You don't have to choose just one way, you can do both. It is possible. And you can make them do it. And this is critical that you do. That's number one. I would love for this community to not focus on masjids anymore, but to focus on schools. Focus on schools. 
you know, if I fundraise for a masjid, I could probably raise half a million dollars right now. But if I fundraise for a school or a da'a organization or al kawthar or whatever else, possibly not even $10,000 would come from me. And this is the mentality of people, that they think the, the masjid is going to give them jannah, but schools won't. But really it is knowledge that stays with us. We live in a time where information age where knowledge is far more powerful than anything else. So focus on schools. In 1960s, in the 1970s, I remember reading a statistics about the number of masjids in UK. They had, do you know how many masjids there was in UK in 1960, 1970? 30 masjids only. 30 masjids in all of UK. In 1990, do you know how many masjids there were? Please, give me a number. In UK. Any number? 300. Anything else? Uncle, what do you think? I'm trying to engage uncle here. <laughs> uncle, what do you think? Give us a number, uncle. 1,000. 3,000. 3,000. From 30 to 3,000. Can you see how the community has been focusing on masjids? And this is precisely what's happening here as well. Masjid, 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 masjid. Fine, great, it's good. But you can build a school and inside it could be a masjid as well, couldn't you? Yeah. At the end of the day, I would love for this community to focus on schools. And this is my message wherever I go. Schools, schools, schools. And not just build a school and then let your kids go there and let non-Muslim teachers teach there. No, I, by school I mean the whole, the whole nine yards. A school plus quality Islamic education plus quality secular education quality Muslim teachers teaching quality adab and akhlaq and teaching quality Islamic, Islamic knowledge. Does that make sense? This is what I mean by, by schools. So as a community, please focus on knowledge. Please focus on schools. Please focus on bringing your kids back to the deen. As an individual, and this is my last part, and as a family, what is my advice? My advice is to the elders, not to the kids. I'm not going to talk to the kids because I'm going to talk to the elders. You see, at the end of the day, the kids are going to look at the father. If the father is great, the kid will say, I want to be like him. If the father is not great, then he's going to say, oh Allah, don't make me like my father. You want kids to say, I want to be like my dad. I want to be that man. And, that is, and you want your children to say, I'm proud of him. Not just that, you want Allah to preserve your children. And the best way that Allah will preserve your children is if you are righteous and pious. In the authentic narration, in the, in the Quran, we know there is, a, there is a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Khidr, alayhi salatu wasalam, who was a prophet of God, he did a few things. Khidr, who was a prophet of God, when Musa alayhi salatu wasalam went with, to Khidr, this is in Surah Kahf, when Musa went with, to, with Khidr in Surah Kahf, he did three things. The first thing that, that Khidr did was, there was a, 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 a boat, upon which Musa and Khidr was, and then he broke the boat. And so Musa said, why did you break the boat? That belonged to poor people. Khidr said, keep quiet, I'll tell you later. The second thing he did was, there was a man that was walking past, and Khidr killed the man. Why did you kill the man? He was an innocent man. Khidr said, keep quiet, I'll tell you later. Then the third thing, the third and last thing that they did, was that they went to a town in which there was a wall that belonged to orphans in that village. And the wall was about to fall down, and so Khidr fixed the wall. And so Musa said, Alayhi Salatu Salam said, Why did you fix the wall? Why don't you ask for money for it? And so Khidr said, That's it, I've lost my patience. I'm going to tell you now what happened. So Khidr told him regarding the reason why he fixed the wall without actually asking for, for compensation is that the wall belonged to two orphans in the village. This is important. Listen to this attentively. He said, The wall belonged to two orphans in the village. And their father was a righteous man. So Allah wanted to preserve the gold that was, that was there underneath the wall. Because if the wall fell, they would fall on the gold and the gold would be hidden forever. Allah wanted to preserve the gold of the orphans. So, uh, so he told me to, to rectify the foundation of the wall. And then when the orphans had become older, Allah will cause the gold to come out of the earth. And then the, the orphans will take that gold. You can read this in Surah Kahf uh, when you go back, the chapter of the cave in, in, the, in the Quran. Ibn Abbas said, Allah wanted Khidr to fix the wall. 
Allah wanted good for the orphans because of the father who was a righteous man. How many orphans are out there that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not caring that much about? About their goodness and kindness, right? How many orphans do we know of that they are sometimes do not have this same mercy that these two orphans in this, Quran, this verse in Quran are actually getting? Why? Because their father was a righteous man. It is for this reason why? It is for this reason why, my friends, one of the scholars of Islam by the name of Sa'id ibn Musayyib, he used to look at his son and he used to say, my son, I am going to pray more to Allah. I'm going to pray more and I'm going to fast more for your sake. Meaning what? Meaning that when I become a better person and I become more righteous and more pious, then Allah will look after you. Just like Allah looked after those two orphans because of the righteousness of their father. So the fathers and the mothers in the audience, if you want your children, and by Allah I know you are a group and a community that loves to look after your children. You want good for it, I know. You want your children to be better than you, I know. You want your children to be the best out there, I know. But Allah, there's only one way. And that is only by you becoming better yourself. If you become better yourself, if you become more knowledgeable, more righteous, more pious, then your son will say, I want to be like him. And Allah will look after your children when you die. And Allah will look after your children when you're in the belly of the grave. When the angels are coming and telling you about what is happening to your child. And you have no ability, no power to say anything else to them. Zakumullah khair. Thank you for attending. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to all my uncles and my aunties who have helped arrange this. I know all of them have been working very hard. It's very easy for me. I just came from the hospital and said, let's go. Let's go to Brisbane, why? Uh, you know, let's go have a nice time. It's very easy for me to come here and just talk. But wallahi, my uncle, my, my, my auntie's my uncle over here and so many other uncles have been working for the last uh, few months actually, very hard for this. It's the first time they've organized something and I'm thinking, mashallah, they've done an excellent job. Excellent, excellent stuff and zakumullah khair to everybody. My father, my mother, mashallah, they've been so involved and done so much work. And to my brother Nabil as well, mashallah, he's done so much. Please don't leave today without thanking them. So make sure all these people who are walking around, they're the ones who have funded everything, they're the ones who have done all the food, they've done all the marketing, they've done everything. I have done nothing, I'm just talking. It's easy to talk. All right, everyone, thank you, inshallah, we'll see you all again. So before I finish, if you want Al Kautha to come to Brisbane to benefit you all to start a knowledge revolution, inshallah, then please join us at the Al Kautha stall. It's just outside, over there where it says 9, the inside out 9 over there, where I'm pointing. Come over there, inshallah, register your name, join the Al-Kautha team. You'll be joining thousands of team members worldwide, inshallah, and help bring this, this, uh, this concept to Brisbane, inshallah. Zakallah khair. Thank you once again. Thank you, uncle.